And here we go. Cheers, everybody. Mm. We're going to get into the scotch portion of snakes and scotch. But uh, let me show you the snake portion, first of all. Uh, this is what we're starting with. We're starting off small with, with the snakes. This little boy who is, uh, what is he? Asphalt, Orange Dream, Inchy, Calico. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Just just those four awesome jeans. Um, and he just, he looks like Velvet in person. You probably can't tell, but he does. He's just great. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, glad to see that a lot of you voted. That's great. That is that um, concludes the political portion of this live stream. Glad people are voting. Um, good deal. Can everybody hear me okay? Uh, everybody see me okay? Great. I've, I'm getting no uh, complaints right now. So, hi, everybody. Great to see you all in here. Uh, Amy's here. Hi, Amy. Are you, Amy, are you still here? I don't know if you're going to be able to be here the whole, the whole way through. Hi, you guys. Roger at Great Family Snakes is here. I'm working with Roger on something that you guys will see next week. That's really cool. Roger's got a bunch of amazing azanthic snakes and combos thereof. Um, hi, everybody. Good to see you all. I'm just cruising down this. And then... We will get to uh, sound and audio are good. Thanks, Amy. You are here. That's great. Good deal. Okay, so let's talk about what I've got in my glass here. This is something that I've been wanting to try for a long time and uh, had not been able to, but this is Port Charlotte. Wait, let me show you that. You don't need to see the glass. Or actually, maybe you do. Look at this. I've got my... Wait, let me get my face out of the way if I can. This is the... Green, there it is. Green room pythons glass. You saw it there. It it focused on it for a half second. Uh, what I have here is Port Charlotte Isla Barley 2012, which is different than the Port Charlotte. This is a uh, Brooklotic distillery that makes Port Charlotte, and they do a heavily peated. This is not their normal heavily peated, though, which is one of my favorites. I love it. This is their Isla Barley 2012. And I was excited to find a bottle because I've been wanting to try it. And I opened the bottle last night to try it for the first time. And the cork broke, which is so frustrating when you have like a really good bottle of scotch or wine or anything. And then the cork has either disintegrated or it breaks and crumbles in your thing. So I have it all. That was an empty bottle that I showed you. And fortunately this you do you if by the way if you're a teacher, which i am um i have these uh cloth tea bags i mean you can use cheesecloth i guess but you just put the little tea bag in the in the bottle and then pour your liquor through that and it gets all your uh all your cork pieces up so no problem um okay Let's see if I have any, we're going to, as, as per usual, we're going to go through a bunch of questions that came in through the Patreon supporters. They all had some really good questions. I asked them for questions for a video that I put out, what, last week, last week's video had a few questions in it and they sent me a lot of really good ones and I couldn't, didn't have time to cover them all in that produced video. So we're going to do the rest of them today as well as some others that they added to, um, Okay. Look at all these people from uh, West Yorkshire. Where did I just see that? There we go. Uh, Ronnie Gamble from West Yorkshire. We've got somebody from South Africa. Elo from South from South Africa. That's great. Where else do we have people from around the world? Welcome, you guys. So cool that people are joining me from the other side of the earth, which it's probably not a friendly time on that side of the planet uh, right now to be awake anyway. Somebody's asking a question that I'm going to answer, uh, except I just lost it. Uh, 
Well, here, well, wait, wait, here, there's two. Okay, so um, Thief of Dreams says, curious to know about the whole spider champagne wobble thing and if it should be something a new snake owner stays away from or if it's overblown on the interwebs. Well, it's not that it's over. I mean, yes, I'm sure that some people overblow it, but the fact is that spider and champagne snakes are great and they, they thrive mo most of the time they thrive. There have been, uh, you know, you can, you could see there's, there's a channel or two that, ha that shows an extreme example of wobble where you've got a snake that just is having a really hard time. Uh, that is not common at all. And, uh, but, but spiders do have, have a wobble as do other, uh, snakes in, in that same complex like champagne. Um, some of them have like, some of them will have problems if you pair them together and things like that, but just a straight spider will have a wobble at some point, whether it, whether it actually shows or not, uh, is one thing. And if you if you get a spider that doesn't show a wobble as a youngster, it might show up later on in life. But they eat really well. They do just fine. They seem to be happy little snakes. Um, so uh, for a snake keeper, it's not a problem at all. If you like spider, get yourself a spider. And you know, ask ask the breeder about the wobble and see if it's severe or not. You know, uh, you want to ask those questions. But. Um, I, I choose not to breed them. I don't judge other people for breeding them, but I choose not to just because I don't want to deal with that occasional snake that, that has a problem. You know, I don't, I don't want to produce snakes that, that could potentially have problems because as we know, by one snake that's sitting in a, in a bin right there, just normally producing snakes, you sometimes come out with ones that, that have issues. So, um, that little snake though, the, the sister of this little boy, is doing well. She's being assist fed and otherwise doing fine. When I assist feed her, she takes her meal and is able to eat it. And her, her jaw works just fine. And, um, she's pooped. So there's your, there's your update on that little snake. Um, so that's that question. There was another one right here that I wanted to answer. Um, oh, can I, let's just, Let's just block that situation. I wish there was somebody else helping me with these that could just do that kind of stuff for me because it takes me a while to see them. Where where was that other question? There's another. Oh, oh, Ken, uh, this one. I actually just answered this in a video, maybe last week's video. Is it is it an issue worthy worthy of concern when my snake goes? to the cold end of their enclosure after eating. Not at all, and it happens commonly. Snakes actually have produce a endothermic reaction, which is kind of, it kind of means that they're a little bit warm blooded. Uh, they produce their own heat. So a lot of times because that snake is producing their own heat right away when they, when they eat food, they'll choose to go to the cold side. A lot of times it's right away and they'll sit there for like a day and then they'll go to the warm side. So some snakes just do that. And some will just digest on the cold side all the time. If, if your temps are warm enough for them to digest, they'll do that. Uh, okay. Oh, look at all these states. Everybody's here from all these different states in the United States. Clint Martin is here from Black Box, you guys. Uh, if you all have enclosure questions, he is the man. i um, glad you're here, Clint. Hey, Paul Seibel. Look at that. I said your name right. Uh, Seibel was the problem for me before you guys, not Paul. I, I always knew how to say Paul, right? Uh, okay. Just cruising down. All right. We're almost... Okay, I'm gonna block that one and and we're off. Wait, I just blocked that one. How you guys, seriously. Oh, an error occur. All right. Hang on. Block user. These are all bots. These are all spam bots that are putting these in, and I'm just trying to. Clean them up as uh, 
we get one more block user. Okay. Darlene, congratulations on that new snake. An another neighbor gave me an animal. So you're getting free snakes. I'll buy no corn snake. Female. That's great. Congrats. That's awesome that you're getting free snakes. Free snakes are cool. Hi, Northern Lights. Good to see you in here. All right. Uh, we're going to get started, you guys. I'm going to take one more sip of this, which, uh, fair warning, I am drinking this. You know, I don't usually drink much uh, while I'm uh, on these live streams, but I am on an empty stomach. So this could be a real fun live stream. Here we go. Questions from the, uh, actually, let me put him back. He doesn't need to be out for the whole time. He'd probably be happier if I just put him back, right? There you go, little man. And let me just show you if he's still if he's still in here. What this this is why I planned on bringing number four out, but this is this is why I didn't bring him out. Oh, he's hissing too. He's just he's in a little box. So this is a very long box that I think a knife sharpener came in and I just cut it up. And he's in here. He doesn't want to come out. He's very cute, and. Uh, but they they love these little boxes, you guys, like toilet paper rolls, anything. It's great. I have my my neighbor and good friend Yoli brings me over any boxes and stuff that she has because she knows that she knows that my snakes like them. All right. What was I doing? I'm getting hang on. Okay. This clipboard has questions on it. And we're going to get to those questions in a moment. Oh, you guys want to see B. Arthur Dent real quick before I get to the questions? Here we go. Real fast. And I'll tell you what I'm doing with her, too. So normally, with this young lady, with a, with a snake like this who's not eating... Um, I would try to not handle very, very much until they started eating, Espe especially if it's a snake that's like that I didn't hatch here, that that's just new to me and they, and they weren't eating. I definitely wouldn't handle them at all, but this snake hatched here. And for those of you who don't know, she has a little dent on the side of her head. The Patreon supporters have named her before we knew it was a, her, her name was Arthur Dent, uh, but now, then when we realize that it's a girl, her name is now B. Arthur. So B. Arthur Dent here. She has a little dent on the side of her face. And she also has a jaw, a weird kind of lazy jaw on the side. Although she can articulate her jaw. She can do everything normally as far as I can tell. Uh, she definitely can eat food if I put it in her mouth first. She hasn't grabbed food yet. But the reason that she hasn't grabbed food, I don't think it has to do with her slight deformity. It has more to do with the fact that she is a very frightened snake. And so anything that comes into her enclosure makes her ball up. And so I put I put a live hopper in there, she balls up. I, I offer her a frozen thought hopper, she balls up. So what I'm doing now is just some gentle work with her to get her used to some things. And, and one of those things is, is taking her out occasionally and she'll get to where she does this. Now she's, she, you know, she was balled up there for that whole time that I was talking. And now she's gotten to where after just a couple minutes, she'll come out and kind of explore. She doesn't do a lot of tongue flicking, but occasionally she does. I'm not seeing it right now. Um, she just has, you know, she's got some issues with her mouth. It's this, there, there's a muscle on the side, the back side of a ball python's head that kind of makes her head fat and triangular. And she's missing that muscle on that, on that side of her head. And on the same side, she's got kind of a lazy jaw that, that will, that will sort of be wonky sometimes, especially like if she yawns, you can, you can see it. Um, and then she doesn't tongue flick a lot. She's not like always tongue flicking. Other than that, those those are issues. But other than that, she acts like a normal snake. She cruises around. 
She hides when she's supposed to hide. She can swallow food. She can poop. All those things. She just seems like a normal snake. So I am uh, doing the best I can with her. She's had some assist fed meals and, and she seems to be doing well with them. Um, so that is that. Uh, let's see. So here, here's what we're going to do, you guys. I'm going to get into these uh, questions from the Patreon supporters because I have a bunch of those and I want to get through them. If you have a question that you want me to see, there's a couple ways to do this. You can wait till I'm done with, with the Patreon questions. And sometimes I go back and forth, but wait till I'm done with those. I'll try to catch up. I'll try to, I'll try to see uh, questions. But as you know, if you've been to my live streams before, I miss a lot of questions. So if there's something you really want me to see, super chat it, and I'll see the super chat and answer your question. Um, otherwise I might just see it. I'm not saying that you have to pay to get your question answered because I try to answer everybody's, but super chat, I'll always see. So I'm going to put B Arthur back and then we're actually getting to these Patreon questions. Hold on one second. There she goes. All right, let's do it. Justin says, as a brand new owner, I wonder if you can cover some seemingly simple things such as ways to prevent the, or ways to present the food, tools to use. Uh, uh, let's see. Dun, 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 dun. That stuff I covered in the other video before, the stuff that I'm reading, not allowed. Um, oh, asking vitamins, should we be adding? No, you, no, you don't need to. There's, you know, there's a lot of reptiles, especially lizards, that that you need to add calcium or certain vitamins. And snakes don't need that. They get everything that they need from their, uh, from the food that they eat. Now, that I, I'm not going to get into the Da Vinci boa stuff that I that I give to snakes that are picky eaters. Those are just vitamins and calcium. Uh, but that's for a snake who, ha, who, I'm trying to promote their appetite um, rather than intentionally giving them supplements. You, you know what I mean? Uh, that supplement is really just, it is vitamins and calcium, but it's to promote their appetite. And I, I recommend it. It's good stuff. It's called Da Vinci Boa. It's pretty expensive, but uh, it, it oftentimes helps snakes to start eating better. Um, but the other, the other question though, oh, it was just the simple stuff of presenting things. So yeah, here, here's just a couple of really quick things. So th these are, these are things that you would potentially hold a prey item with this kind of works, but it's really hard to get a good grip on a prey item. These things, you can get them longer than this. The, these are, uh, are these called forceps or are these called, I don't, I don't know what they're, it doesn't matter what they're called. The point is these little scissory things that somebody put in the chat, what these are called. Is this an actual for, this is usually a lot. I don't have to use the T uh, they pulled a, I'd use this. And then, you know, your snakes are going to all kind of be different as to how they want the rodent to dance around or whether even they care. You know, I have some snakes that don't care. I just, put the thing in front of their face and they take it right away. Some of them need a little dance. And sometimes the dance is that it just kind of shakes a little bit in front of them. And some snakes, I have to move it away from their face and put it back into their face and move it to the side and then, and then have it like it's running in front of them. It's very silly how, how picky they are about what they want their uh, food to do. Um, and then I have a snake or two that, that will do this thing where if I, if, if they seem interested, they have to seem interested in it, but they're just not striking right away. I'll touch the rodent to their neck and it will cause them in, in tiger lily's case. And sometimes Dolly's case, it just causes them to wrap the, the, um, prey item. They won't strike at it. They'll wrap it and then they'll eat it sometime later. And sometimes they don't eat it, but usually they do. Uh, in Molly Malone's case, my Ultramel, she uh, she will strike. Usually what happens is she wraps and then strikes the butt and that's fine. It doesn't matter. She, and then she can eat it either face first or butt first. For those of you that are new, don't worry if you're if your snake eats uh, a prey item backwards. A lot of times, especially young snakes do that because they haven't figured it out yet. It just takes them longer, but it's not a problem. They do that in the wild, too, sometimes. 
So that's that. You just kind of have to experiment with, um, what am I doing with these? You got to experiment with, with your, uh, how, how you dance those things around, uh, your prey items. I'm going to put those right there. Oh, I want to show you guys something. We're going to get back to these questions, but I want to show you these. I want to show you these things before I forget. And, and while we have, I don't know how many people we have in here, but, uh, this is cool. So you guys may have seen if you, if you follow my Instagram or if you watch the video that I included this in, uh, twice in a row now, two years in a row, the inspector, when he's in breeding season will act like an insane person. And, um, he just goes crazy. He kind of, what, what he reminds me of is a male reticulated Python. It's common for male retics to, uh, to be very, um, so, sort of aggressive toward, and, and by aggressive, I mean, it's, it's still defensive. They're kind of defending their female, defending their territory, but, but they will take a male human being. They can kind of tell between the difference between a male and a female human being. And they're like, get out of my space. I, I don't want you around. And the inspector does this with me. Um, it, it's important to know that not all male ball pythons do this, but the inspector definitely does. And I want to show you a video that I took. I, you know, I always have my phone. I always try to get, get the cool stuff on video, but it's never like the one thing that, that started the incident. So I was sitting on the couch. I had, what had happened was I had taken the inspector out of Damara's enclosure. This is when he went crazy last year. You guys saw that video, same situation. So it was morning. I had let him stay in Damara's enclosure overnight because I tried to take him out the night before they were unlocked, but he wasn't having it. So I went, okay, I'll let you stay for the night and then I'll take you out in the morning. So he was kind of being a little bit crazy in the morning, not too bad, but I thought, you know, let, let's just see what happens if I let him free roam for a bit instead of putting him back in his enclosure because he didn't want to be in there. He, he just wanted to sort of cruise around and be crazy. So I just put him down on the floor and I let him free roam and he went behind the couch in sort of behind the mirror, which is next to the couch. I have this big stand up mirror. And all I did was put my hand down and he saw the movement of my hand and the heat signature. And he came fast, came up. There's like a, there's like a box kind of behind the thing where he could, where he could um, get up to the top of the couch. He came up quickly and joined me on the couch. So then I started rolling. So watch this. So there he is, just being confrontational. That's after he sort of flew up and he's sitting on my arm like that. Like he would never choose to do that. Even co like come at me or anything, whether whether um, sort of in an angry mood or not. He would never choose to come towards me, but he did. And that didn't work. That didn't get me off the couch. So what he did next is this video. He went, he went down to the floor and in, I would say, less than 10 seconds, he was under the couch bumping my leg with his coils. So he saw my leg down there and he's like bumping, bumping. So uh, this is him right there. Just trying to get, since I guess the, the upper part of my body, he wasn't able to shoo away. So the leg part, now watch this little move that he does. He just comes up and goes flick flick <laughs> and goes back like get out of here. I don't think he'll ever bite me because he's been so mad before and and sort of that's kind of aggressive behavior. I hate to say that snakes are aggressive because they're not. He is still being defensive. He's saying, "Get out of here. This is my territory where where I know there's females in the room and this is my space and I don't want you in my space." Um but uh how do I how do I stop this or remove? Uh Anyway, crazy stuff. So I put him back in his enclosure and he kind of threw a fit for about 20 minutes. Then he went back in his hide and fell asleep, which <laughs> made me happy. Uh, what a nut though, right? So that crazy thing happened. And then um, I'm going to show you, with, I'm going to show you this thing with, with, uh, with Maya, my black headed Python. I told this story in a, who did I tell the story to? Oh, it was it was at the Retic Lounge because it had just happened that day. We were we were doing a little meeting at the Retic Lounge, and um, so here's what happened. And I'm going to show you this video too. 
this is a, this was kind of a failed target training video because I was trying to target, I was trying to target my, uh, my black headed Python. And then I was just going to give her a rodent and she got so excited about the target that she struck and wrapped. So I had to wait for her to unwrap. It takes a while for her to realize she's not getting any food that way. And she unwraps. And then what I try to do is once she's totally unwrapped, I show her the target again, make her do what she's supposed to do, which is touch it with her nose or her tongue. And then I give her a rodent. Now, separate from that, let's talk about the thing that I watched the day before. I watched a, it was Animal Expert Reviews um, Animal Movies movies with animals in them. And it was uh, the guy, he's a famous animal expert. I can't remember his name, but he's on Joe Rogan a lot and stuff like that. But anyway, he's reviewing Anaconda and they show the scene where the Anaconda takes its tail and whips it around John Voight. Like it's a whip and um, uh, it wraps him up with the back of its tail and then comes in with his head and grabs John Voight. And the, and the guy says, that's just not realistic. That's not how snakes do it. They don't, they don't use their tail as a whip to wrap around you and then, and then turn around and go for your head, which I agreed with. I was like, yeah, that's ridiculous. And maybe it is for an anaconda, but apparently not for a black headed Python, because here's what happened. So you're not going to see when she wrapped up the target because it's just too long of a video. This is after she's unwrapping the target or maybe unwrapped it. And I'm kind of offering her the rodent, but I accidentally touch the rodent to the back of her tail and watch what happens. Here we go. So there she is. She's coming out of that thing. All right, I'm trying to target her again. Here comes the rodent down from the top. Watch her tail. Whip, whip, whip. And then she grabs it like it's John Voight. Like she thought, sorry, I'm blocking everything with the target now. But uh, but she did exactly that. She whipped the back of her tail around the rodent to catch it and then came around and grabbed its head as though that rodent was John Void. Pretty crazy. Uh, so that was interesting behavior. Um, top fur, we're going to talk about target training uh, in, in a bit. Um, the, the thing with target training, especially if you're starting a snake out, is it needs to be a snake that uh, that is very food motivated. And there are some ball pythons, as we all know, that are not very food motivated. And to me, that's not a candidate for target training, although I'm sure it would be for Lori Torini because she's doing it. She's using things other than food. But that might be also when the snake is a little bit older and more established. You know, she's using target training to mean like out of the enclosure time and stuff like that. Um, other rewards that are not food based. Uh, Erica, it was not clinch reptiles. It wasn't any of the reptile people that, that we all know and love. It was just it was a random uh, biologist guy that, that is not Clint. Um, so anyway. Those were crazy things. And uh, let's get back to these questions really quick. Mm. So you guys at Port Charlotte, by the way, I didn't tell you. That reminds me of Lagavulin. If you're an Isla Scotch person, you know Lagavulin. This Port Charlotte Isla Barley reminds me of Lagavulin in that I drink it and I go, oh man, that's dessert. It's like, it's like oranges and caramel, caramel, caramel. It's the same thing, right? Oranges and caramel mixed with sea brine and peat. Not a lot of smoke. I'm not getting a lot of smoke, but, but definitely peat flavor, but it doesn't taste like a barbecue like Ardbeg does. All right. We're done with the, we're done with the scotch portion of <laughs> this show. Uh, Chantel Maya is not full grown by, by any stretch of the word at this point. She will be, um, I'm guessing that she'll be seven or eight feet long and as thick as let's say a, like a, a water bottle, you know? So she'll, she'll get quite a bit bigger. Um, she is, there is a cage being built for her that will be her uh, forever cage. I don't like that she's in a tub, but that's where she's at right now. Uh, her new cage will be 
five feet long and uh, it, it'll be good for her. It'll be cool. And I'm getting a custom. We're going to talk about this. We'll, we'll talk about it when I get it, but I'm, but I'm getting a custom hide for her that enters from the top instead of the front because black headed pythons burrow and they, they go underground and it makes her feel like she's going underground if she enters from the top. Um, but we'll talk about that when it, when it comes, that's, uh, that's a little ways down the road. Anyway, um, here we go. Steven asks, dealing with a dwarf retic pushing or rubbing, we think we address the issue by adding a ton more height to the enclosure with cheap plastic tubs, more hides, fake plants. Um, uh, okay, so made the, made the enclosure better. We're still monitoring the issue, but since past few changes, uh, no signs of pushing. Okay, yeah, so a lot of times you'll make a change. We're talking about retics specifically. They, they are notorious for pushing. And the first thing to check if you have a retic that's pushing is, is your heat, you know, make sure that, that it's not too hot in there. And I, ha and, and some like it, you know, you see, you say that like on the warm side for a retic, 88 degrees, something like that, maybe just under 90, but a lot of times that's too hot for them. So you bump it down to 85, 86. Um, if you're at 85, I would bump it up a degree at least when maybe when they're digesting food. Um, I think mine, both of mine are at about 86 right now, but that's a big common cause of, of pushing is, is the heat, uh, it being too hot and then them just wanting out or wanting to be fed. So echo pushes a lot when she's wanting to be fed. And when she sees me, if I'm not here, I have a camera on her cage and I can watch, I can check in on her. She's, I've never seen her push when I'm out of town, when I'm not in the room. When I am in the room and she's hungry, she'll she'll push. So uh, there. So this is also good timing because I mentioned the retic lounge before. That's a new. It's a it's a podcast, but they do it on YouTube also. And um, if you're into retics, especially if you're new to retics, it's it's a really good channel. And tomorrow's episode, I happen to know, is on pushing. So check out that episode of the retic lounge coming out. I think tomorrow. Should be a good episode. Those those guys are great. Uh, so there's that. Um, okay. Uh, the Harbors have a good question. Can you talk about a snake's liquid intake? I was reading up on prolapsed cloacas and how they can be caused by insufficient hydration. Um, uh, so knowing how much a snake ought to be drinking might be useful. Yeah. So that's a tough one because we usually, we oftentimes don't see our snakes drinking and some snakes tend to like to drink water more than others for some reason. Um, uh, and, and there are other snakes that never drink water and they get all their hydration out of their, their rodents that, you know, that they're eating. Uh, prolapse is not a huge problem with ball pythons, although it do, does happen. It's, it's more common with like, um, chondros, you know, green tree pythons, stuff like that. And, and I mean, any snake could have a prolapse, but it's really if too big and uh, way that, that, um, that work well, uh, you know, sugar water apparently works. I've, I've actually never dealt with it myself. I'm just, I'm going by hearsay. So I'm telling you stuff that I've heard at this point. I try to flag that if I'm talking about something that I don't have actual direct experience with, but apparently sugar water works and, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and then a vet, you know, a lot of times, especially if it, if it's happening over and over the snake needs to see a vet. So, but uh, just drinking enough water or being, they didn't even have to drink the water, just being hydrated enough, you know, through, through eating regularly and having high enough humidity and such like that will, will prevent prolapses. So that's cool. Um, Erica says, how about how not to get pooped on? Like I did last night. Uh, that's, that's pretty, that's actually something to, to talk about because there, there's a couple of things with that. Uh, ball pythons or, well, I shouldn't say, yeah, so most snakes don't poop very often. Ball pythons definitely don't poop very often. So there's a thing to think about if your snake is pooping on you. 
if it's just randomly pooping and like you just happen to take it out during the the month that like the moment in the in the month that they're going to poop that's really bad luck but if you're taking your snake out and you're finding that it's often pooping on you when you take it out that's a scared snake and they're doing that as a like they're scared and they're evacuating their bowels because they're frightened. So it's a snake that needs um, some, some uh, socialization. And I would say socialization without, without the handling, without just yanking them out of their enclosure, doing that thing where you sit next to their enclosure, show them your presence there and, and nothing bad is happening, you know? So, um, so wind it back to that. So this is a snake that's maybe not being defensive and biting you every time you go in to, to take him out, but you go in, take him out. He poops on you. That's, that tells me that they're pretty, pretty scared. Probably. Um, the, the other thing, just, you know, if you feed a snake a big meal and then a couple of days later, later you pull them out, they might poop on you and you can look just about, you know, their lower body, they have what we call sausage butt. That's a, something that as a new snake owner, you'll hear people talk about sausage butt. That just means that they're very thick right before their cloaca. And that means they're going to poop. And a lot of times I will pull a ball python out, look at them and go, oh, this is probably not the time to be holding my snake. And then I put them back in their enclosure and sometime that day they'll poop. So there we go. Thus concludes our section on fecal matter. Sorry if you're eating dinner. Okay. Um, how to work with very timid snakes. Mine literally trembles when I touch him, <laughs> Tiffany. Uh, yeah, that goes back to what I was just saying. Um, that's a snake that needs to be worked with without necessarily touching them for a while. You know, just uh, do that thing. I mean, I've talked about this in, in a lot of videos, but do that thing where you sit there with an open enclosure and just let them see your presence and you're hanging out with them and you're not touching them necessarily and things are okay. Just do that for a little while. And then you can, you know, just sort of see what their body language is. Um, okay. Things to do to help decrease head shyness. My guy still gets freaked out if anything touches his head. I'd love to work with him using techniques to reduce that over time. Yeah, so that is, um, I've talked about that in a live stream before, but it's been a while. Let me let me give you an example of this. Oh, let's take, let's use, uh, here, hang on. Oh, you know what? Let's do this. Let's just get Tiger Lily because people are going to ask to see her anyway. So let's uh, let's do that. We'll show off Tiger Lily and she's still sleeping. She's just waking up and pulled her out of Tiger Lily prefers a, a whiskey sleeve over her hides. Oftentimes she'll she'll digest in her warm hide. But then if she's not digesting, she's in a whiskey sleeve, which I think is pretty funny. Um, so Tiger Lily here. Uh, if I, I don't think she's that head shy, boop, boop. Nope. So I can just come up and, and touch her nose, touch her head. She's not very head shy, but if you have a head shy snake, the, it's, it's really simple. The technique is this, that you're holding your snake. You've, you've got them, make sure they're awake. Don't do this when they're just kind of waking up, you know? Um, but so she can feel that I'm touching her body right here. She knows what that is. She's, she is, uh, she's aware that she's in my hands right now. Right. And so she's aware that my hand is right here. If I start to move up her neck like this, she'll, she'll move, you know, a lot of times they'll, they'll move themselves like she just did, but that, that allows me to touch her head on the way, whether she moves or whether I just move my hand down, it, it allows me to touch her head in a way that's non-threatening. It's more threatening if I come at her this way, and boop her on the nose. A lot of snakes will jump back really fast. That's very scary to them. This happens to be a snake that's not too worried about that. But um, but that's the way to do it. Start start from up here. And, and keep in mind that this head shyness is really upper third shyness. So it's their neck. Their upper third is about... I keep bumping this thing. Their upper third is about right, right here down. And a lot of times anywhere on this neck, they're going to be real jumpy. So if you start 
on the on the thicker part of the body, work your way down, touch the head. Just do it a few times. You don't have to do it for an hour, you know. Um, just do it a few times each time you handle them, and they'll get used to that sensation of you touching their head. And it won't be as big of a deal. Uh, okay. Where are we at? All right. Let me, let me, before we get to the next question, let me check on this to see if it looks like you guys are. I'm at the bottom here. I think a lot of things have been said. I don't see any. Okay. I'm going to say nothing for me at this point. I don't see any super chats or anything. So, um, <laughs> I see that Amy's trying to tell people that she's not great at morph identification. I only know Bob snakes because my ADHD was super high fixed, uh, hyper fixated on his channel. Huh. Amy knows my snakes really, really well. Uh, if you have a snake that is not a morph that I have in this, in the green room, Amy may have a problem uh, identifying it, or maybe she won't. She surprises me a lot. Okay. Scott, welcome to the channel. I just found the channel a few weeks ago and have watched almost all of them. That's a lot of videos to watch. That's a lot. That's a lot of binge watching. Welcome. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're here. Um, okay. Let's get back to this. Okay. Um, so Berkland 97 says not exactly a challenge or a problem, but I was watching a YouTube video and the guy was talking about handling aggressive juvenile snakes. That would be defensive juvenile snakes and how he likes to handle them for upwards of an hour a day to get them used to it at the beginning of their life. Do you think it's a good idea? No, I don't think it's a good idea. That is a thing that I believe is called flooding. But I want to check with an expert on this. Hang on. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get Lori Torini on the horn so she can weigh in on this. Because Lori, as many of you know, is an expert animal trainer. And she knows all the terms that I don't know. Uh, but ra rather than saying what I think about it, let's let's see what Lori thinks. I'll put it on speaker. I hope you guys can hear this. Hello. Hey, Lori. How are you? I am good. Good. I'm on. I'm on a live stream right now. And I have a question for you. Are you are you willing to answer a, a question or two real quick? Sure, no problem. I just finished up another meeting, so you called it a perfect time. Awesome, that's perfect. I want to make sure that you guys can hear sure. Lori uh, from my phone. So somebody somebody type in there whether the sound is good when when she's talking. Um, so Lori, here's the uh, here, here's one of the questions. Um, I was watching a video and the guy was talking about handling aggressive juvenile snakes and how he likes to handle them for upwards of an hour a day to get them used to it at the beginning of their life. Do you think this is a good idea? What do you think about that? Well, I have a, I have a couple of questions first. So what does aggressive look like? Because a lot of people like to throw that word aggressive around, but what, what does that mean? What is the snake doing that he's perceiving as aggressive? Yeah, right. So that's really important to know. But let's just set that aside and assume the snake is just averse to handling. It's fearful of the person. It's fearful of the experience. It wouldn't be trying to get away or behave in what this person is perceiving as an aggressive manner if it was comfortable and relaxed with what's happening to it. And so if you force yourself on an animal like this snake and it has no ability to get away, that is called flooding and it's considered unethical. Um, among animal behaviors and trainers. So I would absolutely say that is bad. It's much better to allow the snake through gradual desensitization, 
and approach and retreat to get used to you on their own until they're choosing to come to you and investigate your hand or investigate your leg or investigate your smell. Because if all of you think about what it would be like to have someone force themselves on you and they're holding you down underwater or tickling you or sitting on you and you have no ability to get away, how would that make you feel? Right. Right. It's yeah, it, it's um, it's, it's kind of going to make me like you if you do that to me. And so it isn't going to make the snake like you. It's only going to make the snake either give up because they're exhausted or they enter a state of learned helplessness, realizing that under these circumstances, nothing they do matters. It isn't going to make them like you or have more positive emotional valence towards any interactions with you. It's just going to make them probably hide more and try to escape and avoid more the next time they see you coming. Right. Right. It's, um, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to put it in layman terms. It's kind of jerk behavior is what it is to, to do that. It's really disrespectful. So yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. That's, that's great. I mean, that's, you know, it's, it's something like, it's almost like when when people talk about breaking a horse, you're you're breaking a snake or breaking an animal. Like you're you're trying to break them to get to get used to you, but you're literally breaking their brain by going, "Look, no matter what you do, you're going to be forced into this anyway, so you might as well just relax and take it." Which is right, re really exactly. terrible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um thanks for that. I I love your expert. Uh I I love when you're able to put things in words that make sense. Cause I don't always know the right words. I have another question. You do, you do well at translating my behavior science because it just rolls out of my mouth before I have a chance to try to maybe put it in simpler terms. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. We should, we should do more videos together, Lori. Uh, all right. So here's another one that, that I think you can, uh, uh, in fact, the person even asked for you. Um, so this oh. one, this is from Wendy saying I'm target training. Uh, but when they are trained, it seems mean to use the target to get them to go somewhere and then not give them any snacks. Is it mean or confusing for them to, to not be rewarded? And then she says, if Lori happens to have any shared thoughts about it, uh, with you, that would be cool to hear also. So, so we're going to actually hear your thoughts on it. Let me say my thoughts on it though, before you do, because I, I want to, cause you're, like, you know this better than I do. So I'm just going to say what I think, and then we'll see if I'm right or not on this. Okay. My my feeling is this, that that these snakes, um, you know, they when they're in the wild, they do behavior all the time that is supposed to get them to catch a meal. But they don't catch a meal hardly ever. Like, it's so rare that they actually catch a meal. So having them do a behavior um, that oftentimes results in a meal. I, I think it's okay if it sometimes doesn't result in a meal. And I'll, and I'll give a good example right behind me right now. You can see this, or you can't probably, Lori, unless you're watching my live stream, but the, the people can, they can see this target. Uh, I've got this blue target. And when Echo is out, Echo always goes straight to the target and sits right there hoping that a meal is going to happen. I will never feed her a meal if she finds her target in the house on her own. It's only if I offer her a target, but I don't mind that. I don't mind her finding the target and going, all right, this is, this target means food. So let's see if I get food, you know? All right. Now I'm done talking. What do you think about this? Okay. Correct. You're talking sort of two different things here. Some behaviors that we teach the snakes, they are going to get reinforced for intermittently. And we actually purposely put them on an intermittent reinforcement schedule, which means sometimes they get reinforced for it and sometimes they don't. And it can actually motivate behavior. And I'm trying to think of a human example, but I guess that's how slot machines work. You sit at the slot machine and every now and then you get reinforced, right? Because you win some money. And so that just makes you sit there more and put more money in, even though probably 90% of the time you're not winning anything but you keep going back. Right. So behaviors that we would put on an intermittent reinforcement schedule are like if we're trying to encourage the snake to shift out of the enclosure on their own onto a station or into an exercise tent or onto our hand. We want that to be their choice. And then every now and then we want to deliberately reinforce them for that. So maybe 
one out of every few times you set up a puzzle feeding exercise for them or a foraging exercise or you feed them outside of the enclosure. That is going to get them thinking, oh, when I leave my enclosure and go on this little hunt, sometimes I find food. And so it makes me want to do that more. And aside from that, usually freedom and exploration is reinforcing just in itself. But with the target specifically, that's a tool, that's a communication tool. And so if you're specifically using a target for something, you always want to reinforce that 100% of the time, which is called a continuous reinforcement schedule, because you don't want that target to lose meaning as a salient cue, as a, you don't want that target to lose meaning if you need to use that as a tool. So if I need to use that target for an emergency, for an emergency recall, which I have done that actually when a snake has gotten in a place where it could be dangerous for them to be and I couldn't reach them. You want to reinforce that every single time so that that target remains very, very salient to them as something that they are going to get reinforced for. So if you break out the target and use it, the snake knows I am going to get reinforcement. I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, so what about the the instance? And I I know that that uh, TC, your retic oftentimes finds his target. Yeah. So you also have to look at the totality of the circumstances and the context. So if I am manipulating the target in a training context or in an actual context where I'm using it to shift the snake or to call them out from somewhere. I am there with the target presenting it to them and they should learn under those circumstances, they are going to get reinforced by me. In fact, that's what we train them to do. If they just happen to find it on their own, I'm out of that equation and they're not going to get reinforced for that because they just happened upon it on their own. So it's really two different circumstances. Right. That's kind of what I thought too. Okay. So yeah, I don't reinforce TC for being, for finding the targets on his own and going there. What I, I will actually do to, to give him a bit of a challenge is if he has found the target, I will get a different target and I will call him away from the target and I will reinforce him for coming to the target I am holding. Oh, that's and interesting. To be with. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. So, so the intermittent reinforcing on the target is not, is not the thing to do necessarily. Um, not with the target. Intermittent reinforcement is good for things if you are like um, station training. So if you have some kind of station and you want to put it next to the enclosure and have the snake come out onto it, the snake can choose to come out onto it. And sometimes they might find food. Sometimes they might get a target training session on the station. Sometimes they might just get to roam around. And so they're intermittently experiencing things on that station <clears throat> that they find reinforcing, but I'm not deliberately reinforcing them with food every time. Um, I've also used that for like shift training into a shift box. So I'll set the shift box or the travel container, um, the transport tub outside of the enclosure and intermittently I'll put food in it, but not every time. So sometimes they come out and they don't find food in it, but they sort of just explore. They might roam around the room and then they go back to their enclosure. But those are different. Those aren't being used as a signal, as a communication tool. Those are activities that we want the snake to like and engage in. Right. But the target is a specific tool. It is a, it's like me saying to verbally come over here and sit down. It's more of a, we used to call them in animal training verbal commands or a, a command, but now we like to call them requests because the animal can always opt out. Sure. Um, so reinforcing the target is like reinforcing a word that I'm telling you to do something or asking you to do something. Whereas intermittent reinforcement of like stations and transport tubs and exercise tents or other things, you're, you're not putting that thing there and demanding that the snake do something. You're giving them opportunities to engage with it and you're hoping they find it pleasurable enough that they want to come out intermittently on their own and use that thing. Right. I gotcha. If you teach them any kind of signal that you expect them to do on cue, like on command, so to speak, you want to reinforce that every single time, just like recalls with dogs. Like if you are teaching your dog a solid recall, you want to reinforce them a hundred percent of the time they come back to you. If you right. skip even a few times, then they're going to think, ah, 
maybe I don't want to go back to her. I gotcha. I might not. Okay, yeah. cool. So for those of you target trained, that's good for me to know too. Uh, for those of you target training, make sure you have reinforcement if you're using that target. But if they find it on their own in their house, in your house, it's cool. Um, right. Lori, thank you so much for your thoughts. I really appreciate you spending time on the live stream with us. Okay, you're welcome anytime. All right, bye, Lori. Bye. You guys, how great is Lori? Uh, behavior education. Somebody, somebody put her uh, information in the in the chat. Lori Torini, behavior education. Uh, does a lot of snake training and behavior stuff, which is cool. Uh, that was nice of her to join us and give her thoughts on that. So Tiger Lily is being super adventurous. Um, obviously, I'm going to put this here. She's just wanting to explore, but I don't want her on that ladder because then I've got to watch her. So we're not doing that. Um Okay, I'm glad that helped a lot of you. I know a lot of you are fans of Lori's. Um, some of you may not be into the training as much and uh, whatever, but it is really interesting stuff. Uh, oh, Lori's on. Good. Lori, I'm glad you're here. Thanks so much for thanks for my, thanks so much for being on. Um, that was cool. It was cool to have a chat. And I'm glad that it worked in the microphone and people could understand what you were saying. All right, so let's get back to this really quick, you guys, with some questions. So I would say, uh, just to just to piggyback on that, you guys, instead of flooding the animal and having a baby snake be with you for an hour, uh, if if you're doing a handling session, I always and I talk about this a lot, but I always say ten or fifteen minutes. That's good. So with little B. Arthur Dent there, I am handling her. And she what, what I do is it's 10 or 15 minutes because it takes her three or four minutes to come out of a ball and to start exploring around and, and um, acting sort of exploratory and normal like she's not super scared. Um, if I had a snake that in 10 or 15 minutes didn't come out of that ball, that would tell me that that's not a snake that I should be handling right now. I should back up and do some other stuff. Um, but, uh, so that's that. Oh, Amy, are you leaving? Bye, Amy. Thanks for being here. We all love having Amy in the chat. She's cool. Um, all right. Let's get to a few more of these questions. Okay, so this is an interesting one. Uh, let, me, let me get through it. It's long, but... I'll try, I'll paraphrase. Uh, so I'm helping a friend who is away in recovery for several months by caring for two ball pythons in her home in their, in their regular enclosure. She cohabs them and has done so for a couple of years quite successfully. The similar, uh, the smaller of the two eats like a champ, one large mouse every two weeks. The larger one hasn't eaten since my friend left three months ago. I've tried, uh, tried a bunch of different things. Um, always separated the pair for eating. I've tried them both in tubs, leaving a big one in the enclosure. To, uh, okay, so just tried a bunch of stuff. Uh, she's going to take the large one to the vet, but in the meantime, do you have any suggestions? Looks like my lights went off in the cages. Uh, so this is tough because cohabbing snakes, um, well cohabbing most snakes, but certainly ball pythons is not recommended. And the problem is that they're not your snakes. You're taking care of them. So you're doing everything right. I mean, uh, keep trying different things and taking to the vet is, is a thing, um, that, that you could do, but here's, here's my guess. What happens a lot of times with cohabbed ball pythons is they do great for a long time, sometimes for years. And then all of a sudden they don't do great. All of a sudden one of the snakes stops eating. All of a sudden there's a, there's a fight. Maybe um, we've seen the, the rare picture or two where a ball Python tries to eat another ball Python that they've been living with for a long time. It's just not a good situation. Zoos can do it because they have massive room sized enclosures where the snakes can get away from one another. 
Um, and the problem, the problem with this is, and I know that this doesn't really answer your question, Kimber, because what the, the answer is you're, you're doing the right thing by just trying different things, but it's tough because, they're, because they're not your snakes. So, uh, but it does point to something, which is a lot of times people that cohab, they go, I've been doing it for years. My snake's too great with cohabbing. It's not a problem. Well, snakes change. They, you know, their attitudes about things change and they're, and as, especially as they grow, they'll go through phases where they like certain things or don't like certain things. Sometimes something's a threat with the inspector, for instance, I'm not a threat to him until he's in breeding season. And then all of a sudden I'm public enemy number one in his mind. Um, so, you know, and snakes can have those changing attitudes towards other snakes as well. So cohabbing is never a good situation. Um, so I don't recommend it. That's, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, but Kimber, you're doing the right thing in caring for your friend's snakes. Hopefully your friend can find separate enclosures for them when, when they're, when they're able to, um, yeah. And Lorraine has the same question. Uh, Lorraine saying my question was going to be about same sex cohabbing as well. I don't want to breed my girl. Yeah. So cohabbing the, the problem with cohabbing is not that they might breed. It's just that snakes in general are solitary creatures. And when you cohab two of them, it causes constant stress and you don't necessarily see that. Like, it's not like they're going to fight all the time, but what will happen is a lot of times people go, Oh, my snakes cuddle all the time. They're they, I cohab them and they love it because they're cuddling. Well, they're not cuddling. What they're doing is they are cold blooded animals and probably at about the same time, they're going to get chilly and want the warm side. So they both cruise over to the warm side and that, that cuddling that we're seeing is them sort of trying to jockey for position to get the best spot on the warm side. And um, then they might warm up and go to the cold side at about the same time and jockey for a position on the cold side. And uh, so it's just not recommended to cohab at, at all. Um, and it's not, it, it's not a, a breeding thing. Um, it's just not a good thing for snakes that are solitary snakes to do. Um, it's great for, uh, for garter snakes. You can cohab garter snakes and others, probably others. Um, so I have a few that are similar to this, questions that are like this. I'm struggling. I'm getting adult snakes to transition to frozen thawed. Out of three, I have one who transition. Uh, let me see. Uh, snake acts hungry, hungry, but won't take anything. I also have two younger ones who were eating great and stopped simultaneously. And now we'll only take mice. Yeah. So, and, and this is, you know, you're saying I, um, this is smiley pea snake. Who's a Patreon supporter. Uh, I don't care. For, I don't care if the male is on mice, but the, but the female, the breeding female is going to be tough to get up to, to size on mice. And that's true. Uh, so I have some videos on this. I would say, check out those videos on feeding. Just put, just put green room pythons feeding into YouTube and they'll probably pull up, but, um, you know, scenting the enclosure with a hairdryer on the mouse and then, you know, thaw out a mouse and a rat, s blow the hairdryer onto the mouse, wait for the snake to come out looking for a mouse and then give them a rat. A lot of times that works to just do that little switcheroo. Um, rubbing the, the rat with a mouse helps a lot of times to, to send it that way. There's a lot of, of different tricks that, that you can do. Those videos will help though. Um, eaters always the female. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, I haven't really experienced that. I think it's, I think that's, that might just be coincidence that, all your picky eaters are females. I haven't seen where gender makes any difference on whether a snake is going to be picky or not. Um, Helen's saying that she had, she had a bunch of rat pups in the freezer, but the snake outgrew them basically. So last week I tried to feed him two pups instead of one bigger rat and he ate them 
but he was clearly confused when I offered him the second one. Maybe you know any methods of successfully feeding them two or more rats at a time. Um, so it's not, you know, a lot of people say, don't do that. Like it's really bad. It's not really bad. You totally can do it. They snakes eat multiple prey items all the time in the wild. It's very common for them to go into a rodent den and the rodents that are in there are very small. So they just eat a bunch of them. Um, it is better. I think it's certainly more economical to feed them one prey item that's appropriately sized. But if you don't have that, or if you're in this situation where you've got, you've got rodents that the snake outgrew. So now you're just going to feed them two instead of one that works. I wouldn't do it all the time, but, um, uh, it, it works. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't I, I doubt that the snake was actually confused, you know, probably just happy that you were feeding another one. You know, if the snake if the snake will take a second one, I what I usually do if I'm feeding two. And again, I don't do it often, but um, if I'm doing it, I wait till the snake has pushed the the first one down into their stomach. So it's swallowed. It's gone past their neck. I've watched it go past their neck. It's into their stomach now. Usually they'll start readjusting their, their jaw and tongue flicking around. And at that point, you can offer this, the second one. Uh, and if they'll take it, they'll take it. All right. Amy just did a super chat. Thanks for the super chat, Amy. The belly dancers say hi and they love you and come dance with us next summer. <laughs> hi, belly dancers. I love you all too. Uh, and... I would love to come and be there next summer. We'll see how that goes. I hope it can happen because I love dancing with you guys. I always try to do one of their shows. One of their shows at that festival. I always try to, they do a, Amy's part of a, my favorite belly dance group, you guys. And in their shows, they have the, uh, the audience come up and dance with them kind of at the end of their show. And I try and do one show where I go and dance with them also. It's very fun. All right. I have no belly dancing skills. You don't need skills to do this. You just you just go and do it. They have all the skills, and then you go and dance around with them. It's fun. Uh, okay. Ellie's asking, how long do you quarantine a new ball python? I'll tell you how long I do it, and then I'll tell you what is recommended, because I do not do it for as long as recommended. I usually do a 30 day quarantine. Although I have done quarantines for longer. Uh, if the snake, if I think the snake is potentially has a problem or if it's from a breeder that like, sometimes I always, I always buy snakes from people that I trust, but occasionally there has been a time that I bought from somebody that I didn't know. And at the time that I bought it, I thought, Oh, I trust this person. And then, and then I get a, a kind of a sense that I maybe don't trust them a ton to have, the cleanest of snakes. Um, so, so I'll quarantine for longer, but also in that case, you guys, even if it's somebody that's trusted bit like big breeders that like Justin Kabelka, you buy a snake from Canova and you go, Oh, I don't need to quarantine this snake. This is from Canova. Like there's not going to be any problem. The thing is snakes get our eyes that like stuff happens. Mites happen. You know, somebody comes into Canova and, uh, to see their facility and handle some snakes and they bring in mites from their house when, you know, they were handling their snake that, that morning. Um, I use Canova as an example because I think of their facility as the cleanest, but in that case, they still could get, could get snakes with, with some sort of issue. So, uh, and it's not, there's nothing against the, the breeder. If a breeder sends you a snake that has a problem, unless it has a problem coming out of the box, like if it develops a problem, a lot of times a uh, uh, respiratory infection, it takes a long time for that to actually come out in the snake. And um, uh, so it's nothing against the breeder necessarily. So quarantine, I typically quarantine for 30 days. If you ask a vet how long you should quarantine for, it's 90 days. And so that's what I would recommend is the vet's recommendation. 90 day quarantine, you're solid. Uh, I don't always do that. I do 30. Sometimes I do 60 and I have done 90 before, but it's usually 30 for, for a snake. Captain Nitro just did a hundred dollar super chat with, with no question attached. Captain Nitro, thank you so much for the super chat. 
add a add a question to that if you have one or a comment or anything that, <laughs> that I can read. That's fantastic. I really appreciate that. It's so nice. Um, oh, Lori's saying uh, Canova has been. Uh, has been good to work with me regarding virus testing animals for me prior to shipping. That's cool that, that they'll do that. There, a lot of breeders will do that uh, if you ask for it. Um, and and uh, Roger at Gray Family Snakes, Nido tests all his ball pythons on intake and quarantine for 90 days. So, so Roger, you're doing a quarantine for 90 days. That's cool. Uh, that's good to know. Again, next week's video, uh, we'll talk about some stuff that I'm doing with Roger. That's a cool video. I'm excited about it. I'm almost done editing it. Or future Bob is, anyway. Um, where am I at here? We're, we're close to done with this, you guys. And then I'm going to go and see if there's any questions from the chat. I'm guessing that you guys are chatting amongst yourselves, but I'll, I'll look and see if there's anything for me. Uh, so yeah, we're close on this. So Brett says, Hey Bob, I have a topic idea for live stream. Um, if you have any, uh, okay. If you have a new baby and it's refusing to eat frozen thawed after the usual waiting period, would you try live feeding before assist feeding? Also, how long would you wait? Okay. So I, I want to be clear on this. If we're talking about a newly hatched snake that hatched in your facility, that's the only time that I would even be considering assist feeding at all. Um, but we're going to talk about both situations. So yes, for trying live in either situation. Uh, so I'll, t I'll tell you what I've done with, with the little girl with the dented head. What I did is I tried to feed her frozen thawed and then I tried live and then I tried frozen thawed a couple more times and then maybe another live, maybe I tried live twice and, um, what I did is my, my general rule is if the snake is losing weight, if they're, if they're lose if they've lost around 10% of their body weight when they were hatched, it's time to assist feed. Um, in, in my mind, some people may wait longer, but, uh, I don't want them to lose more than 10% of their body weight before they get some food in them. And, uh, so as soon as she had lost, I probably offered several meals. It was probably, um, a month or maybe maybe five weeks before I assist fed uh, for the first time she had, maybe it was six. I don't remember how long it was, but uh, sh she had lost about 10% of her original body weight. And so I assist fed. Um, if you're talking about a snake that here, let me, let me continue on. Cause there's another for the record, the snake in question is 200 grams. All right. So that tells me something. And I've decided to give him another week trying two more feeds a few days apart. If he doesn't respond, I'm going to live feed. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. At 200 grams, that tells me that that's a snake that has eaten before. So that's probably a snake that, that you bought rather than that you're raising because he wouldn't have hatched out of an egg at 200 grams. Um, so that's not a snake that would be a candidate for assist feeding at, at all at this point, because they'll, they'll eat eventually. And um, so you're, you know, you're trying, you're trying, first of all, you should be trying exactly what the breeder or whoever had the snake before was feeding them. So exact same prey item, whether it's a mouse or a rat and whether it's live or frozen thawed, uh, if it was, if they were eating frozen thawed before, sometimes trying a live will get them to eat, but it's just trying different things and, and adjusting their enclosure. A lot of times what you've got to do, you know, sometimes people will buy a snake from a breeder and then they put them in a big enclosure and that snake is used to living in a little tub. And sometimes you got to put them back in a little tub for, for just a while for them to gain some confidence uh, and eat something before then transitioning them to a, to a larger enclosure. Um, so I think I answered that question. Basically, my I, I don't get concerned until a newborn snake, new hatched snake, has lost 10% of their body weight. Okay. Here's a super chat that I just saw come up. 
Danielle, thanks for the super chat. What are some common symptoms of dehydration? My girl always has water, but because I never see her drink, I worry for, for no reason. Yeah, so common symptoms are, first of all, if they have a bad shed, for one thing, uh, that that points to dehydration. Also, check their eye caps and make sure there are no dents in their eye cap, a dented eye cap. The, the eye cap is just the, the skin that's over the eye, basically, that they shed each, each time they, they shed. But if you see a little dent in that eye cap, that means that they're, that they're dehydrated. Uh, and you probably won't see your snake drink that much because usually if they drink, it's going to happen probably in the middle of the night when you're asleep because that's when they're up and that's when they'll choose to dip their face in the water. Um, but if they don't have dented eye caps and they're, they're giving you good sheds, they're fine. And again, a lot of times snakes don't really need to drink water. If, they're, if, they're, uh, if they have enough humidity and they're eating well, they're getting plenty of, of hydration through the food that they eat. So, uh, they're not as, they don't need to drink water like, like mammals do. Um, but they will drink sometimes. All right. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's a bioactive question. Let's see. Hi, Bob. I found you on YouTube. Uh, quite a lot about building bioactive enclosure, but there's nearly nothing about maintaining it. Okay. So you're looking, getting a ball Python soon and looking to build one. Yeah. So the cool thing about bioactive enclosures is they're not supposed to require much maintaining. I'd love to point to mine back there, but the lights are off. So it doesn't look cool. Uh, you don't really, so you have to spot clean still don't, don't, expect the bugs to eat full snake poops and full snake sheds and stuff like that. I'm still spot cleaning, especially urates. They're definitely not going to eat urates. Uh, so I spot clean, but I've never changed the substrate. That's that enclosure has been going for over two years now. And uh, it's still the same substrate. Now there, there is going to be a change in that particular enclosure coming up. You'll see it when it happens, but the fact is that it's gone a long time without a substrate change. Uh, I do spot clean and that's about it. The maintenance has to do with the plants. If your snake crushes a plant or if a plant doesn't make it for some reason, you might be replacing plants. And there's still a lot of work to be done with a bioactive enclosure. It's not a set it and forget it type situation. Um, so I do that, you know, that one bioactive enclosure I did as an experiment and I still consider it an experiment. I still, you know, uh, is it, is bioactive ideal for a ball Python? I would say that a, that a ball Python isn't the ideal animal for a bioactive enclosure necessarily, just cause you've got to get the right one. You've got to get one. That's not going to crush all your plants and you got to, you know, there's just, there's kind of a lot to do. I like having it. I think it looks cool and I love the science behind bioactive. So I'm willing to do the work that it takes to keep it up, but it does take work with, with a ball Python. Much, much easier with a little gecko, a little gecko or frogs or something, you know. Um, here's a super chat. Crystal, thanks so much. Crystal Moon says, um, this is my first time dealing with hunger strikes. It's winter, but their enclosure, uh, their enclosures are all temperature regulated. Can I get them to eat? Yes, you can. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know their, I don't know the snake's age or anything like that, but this is just one of those things that there's something that they want done differently, probably, you know? Um, and I've said this before, but I think it's important to mention that if this question was asked on Facebook or Reddit or something like that, the responses would be, don't worry about it. Ball Python, it's, it's normal. Ball pythons go off food. It's normal. Just, it's fine. And the fact is that it's not normal. It's, but the difference in the normal means that for a ball, it not just eat for a long time. And that's just part of their natural history. And it's not. Common means that if there's anything wrong, a ball python will commonly go off food. But when, when people say, don't worry about it, it's normal, it makes it so that person won't, they'll, they'll just go, oh, my snake's normal. I'll just wait till he starts eating again. And they won't look for what might be wrong in the enclosure. 
so you're checking temps. You might change the substrate to something else if that's an option for you. Um, uh, you might just change their enclosure around a little bit and see if that's it. Uh, you know, add some add some extra clutter, especially if the snake is young. Um, and then check out my the videos that I have on feeding because there's a bunch of tips on that to get them to get them going. Um, and we're not talking about a breeding situation. There's there, there are times for breeding animals that they do go off food and that that's normal for them because they've ovulated and they got a belly full of eggs instead of, or, or even before they ovulate and they got, they've got a belly full of follicles. Um, and they don't want to, they don't want to eat cause they just don't have a lot of room. So that's a normal thing, but that's different than just your regular pet snake that you're not breeding. Um, let me put tiger lily back really quick because echo has been hoping to come out for so long. So let me just open her door and see if she comes out. Hold on one minute. Okay. Almost there. She's just right here. I've opened her door and I'm going to give her a little hook real quick as she comes out because it's nighttime and I want her to know that she's not eating. I feed them. I feed the super dwarves, especially at all times of the day. They don't eat necessarily only at night. So, uh, it shouldn't be a big problem, but you never know with that one. All right. If she decides to come out, I will, I will bring her in front of the camera. Um, and I think she will decide to come out. She almost always does. Okay. Hang on. You guys, I just want to see if, um, Captain Nitro, thank you so much. Saying, no problem. I just love your content. That's so nice of you. I really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, let's see where we're at on this. We're, we're getting through the end of this thing. Hey, yo, I'm not feeding you. Don't look at me like that. Hang on, you guys. Stop it. That's not food. Don't look at me with those big eyes. <laughs> She's like staring straight at me with these massive food eyes. Um, they're a smart snake, but they have not. Uh, these reticulated pythons have not figured out the difference between what it looks like when I'm feeding and what it looks like when I'm doing a live stream. So <laughs> that's that. She's coming out. I'll, I'll bring her in front of the camera in a minute. Uh, while she's slowly coming out, let's see where this next question is. Okay, not an urgent question, uh, but more so topic of discussion. I like those. Do you have any thoughts on where the ball python hobby will go in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, here's what I hope. I mean, I think I think for ball pythons, there's there's just going to be more morphs and more combos. We're, we're kind of scratching the surface, even though we have hundreds out there. There's There's so many things left to do with that if you're into morphs and such like that. Um, what I'm hoping though, is that I think regardless, the, the snakes will still be popular. Like the ball pythons will still be very popular, I think. Um, but I'm hoping that it'll be more mainstream. And I, th I think it probably will 10 to 20 years down the road. Uh, there might be, we might go through some legislation with certain states where, where they might be outlawed for a minute and then they come back because people fight. There's probably going to be fights over the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, but hopefully we will get to a place where, where snakes are a little bit more mainstream. And, um, you know, I, th I think they're still the ball pythons, especially with the amount of morphs that there are and still finding new ones. There's just, there's so much to do still. Um, Echo, can I just pull you out now? Can we try this so the people can see you? Come here. Come here. No? Okay. All right. She says no. If she body hugs something when I'm trying to pull her out, I'll just let her come out on her own. Um, I really think she's looking for food right now. 
So maybe I'll get bit. Um, okay. So Lisa Gordon has a really great story to tell here. Uh, this is this is great for people who worry when they when they lose their snakes that their snake is going to be dead in a week. It's not. Snakes are super resilient. So check this out. So Lori's saying when snakes escape, even from an outdoor enclosure, might be a topic of discussion. Uh, I was advised by a couple of local exotic snake experts after Stevie escaped. That's that's Lori, uh, Lisa's snake escaped that ball pythons generally do not venture very far, even outdoors. Sure enough, after four and a half months on the lamb, Stevie made an appearance on my next door neighbor's back deck just before Halloween. Much to his horror, uh, much to the neighbor's uh, horror because he's snake phobic, um, Stevie survived oppressive summer temps, drought, a couple of intense, almost tornadic uh, summer storms. Tornadic? Tornadic? Is that a thing? Summer storms. I assume that just means tornadoes. Uh, some very chilly fall nights and the wildlife predators that roam our yards. I'm so glad my neighbors uh, are aware, were aware from the first day of his escape to be on the lookout for him. He also received a clean bill of health from the vet the day after he was found. So that's crazy that, you know, through all that weather, super hot temps, super cold temps, predators, all the stuff, four and a half months on the lamb, as Lisa put it. Uh, and the snake gets a clean bill of health from the vet the next day. So I tell, you know, people message me a lot when, when their snake goes missing. I think that, I think what happens is they look on YouTube and, you know, they look up, what do I do when my snake goes missing? They probably find my video. They probably find snake discoveries video first, and then they find mine. Uh, and, and then because they haven't found their snake yet, they then message me and they're really worried that their snake's going to be dead because it, it got out a few days ago and it's still not back yet. So the point I always try to make with people is that your snake can be gone a long time and, sh and show up later. Um, long after you've gotten a new snake, your old snake might show up. So it's pretty common. Uh, that's a great story though, that, that Lisa took her snake to the vet the next day and got a clean bill of health. That's cool. Uh, all right, let me look at this. And then we only have, two, oh, we don't only have two more because I, I have the Harpers to take care of, but the Harpers are quick, quick rapid fire questions. If you guys know, hi, are you coming? Are you coming to see me? Hello. Are you ready for me to pick you up now? So she's, you can't see her, but she's come all the way over to my hand. Hi. Can we, can we bring you in front of the camera now? You just want to do it on your own. Is that what happened? Hey, you guys say hi to Echo. So let's do this. Let's just let's just see what your mood is right now, huh? You gonna be okay? So Echo is a little when she um she's had she's had a big meal recently. It's digested, like she can be out and moving around, but but she doesn't need a meal for a while. But when she's looking for food, she just hugs me a little bit tighter. I can always tell by her body language, her eyes stuff like that. She's hugging me pretty tight right now. So we'll just, we'll just see how she does. Hi, do you want to crawl on my hat? You want to do that? Crawl on my hat and then maybe go to your tree from the hat. How about that action? Then you can just hunt all over the tree. Okay. Where am I at? Oh, the, okay. So, um, oh, you're just going to be on my hat hunting. That's that works. All right. It's a good, good little super dwarf show for you guys. Oh, really? I don't want you tangled up in this though. I know it's interesting, but. Oh, you guys, I so want to talk to you about something that I made for them. That's so cool, but I can't because it's for a future video. Uh, all right. So I'm just moving on from there. She's going up. All right. So Echo is going through what I believe is a growth spurt because she needs food right now. And I'm trying to support her in that without overfeeding her, but I also don't want to underfeed her. And she's at a point where she needed to up the size of prey by a lot. Um,
Okay, let's see. Um, so poor York says late topic to uh, let's see. Oh, it's, um, at, so poor York is asking about winter temperature is kept fairly cold in their house, mid to low sixties. Uh, what do you do for your snake enclosure? So I mentioned this in, I think maybe last week's video, or maybe it was a couple of weeks ago. I, I don't know, but the point is that, uh, if you, if your snake enclosure is in a cold room and you can't move it to a warmer room, cause that's my, my first thing is, is move it to a warmer room or bump the temps in your room. If you can't do that and, and your entire house is cold, then you just need more heat in, in your enclosure. Uh, so that means like a CHE on the cold side, you just need heat enough to where you've got 80 on the cold and 90 on the warm. You just, you don't want to have a temperature drop in, in the winter time necessarily for this species. It's not, you know, it's not terrible if you're going a couple degrees, if it's, you know, a couple degrees drop, but it's, if it's a significant drop, you don't want that. You want it basically to be the same all, all year round because that's how it is it, at the equator where they live, there's not much of a temperature difference all year round. So that is that. Okay, I'm gonna go through the Harpers. This is the last one. The Harpers have four questions and they're always fun ones. I'm gonna check on Echo really quick and see where she's at. Okay, she's doing good. Number one, did your snake celebrate Halloween? And if so, what did they get up to? The inspector celebrated Halloween. He dressed up as a big jerk for Halloween. And if you don't get that, go back and watch the beginning of my video where I showed videos of the inspector being a big jerk. Um, he's fine now, though. With Thanksgiving and Christmas not far off, do the snakes have any plans to celebrate? And if so, what will they be doing? My guess is for Thanksgiving, the snakes will be uncomfortably digesting their meals. Uh, as as will all of us. I think we all will be uncomfortably digesting big meals. Um, Christmas is is weird in in this household because you know some of the snakes are Jewish. The super dwarves are Hindi. They don't even celebrate Christmas, so we all try to do something and just call it something. Try try not to make it too religious, you know, because I'm not trying to offend any of my um, non non Christmas brought up snakes you know if they're not brought up with christmas it's a little weird so uh that's that number three will there be a green room python christmas special this year i hope so last year was an extravaganza i think i called it an extravaganza i don't know if i can beat last year's like i'm gonna do if, if i do it there's still there's gonna be beard beard christmas lights again because i still have them i can't i can't beat beard Christmas lights, but I can do it again. So there might be that. I don't know. We'll see. I got to, I got to start thinking about a Christmas episode. And then the last question, this is the last question of the clipboard. You guys, what, if anything should be illegal to have ketchup on? Not many things. Um, maybe ice cream. I don't know. I haven't tried ice cream with ketchup on it and maybe it's delicious. Maybe it's good. I don't know. There's not many things that you shouldn't put ketchup on. Uh, you guys, here's another thing that I wanted to mention. I wanted to do this up front, but I'm going to do it here in this part of the video. I got a, I got a drawing in. I got a piece of art in about a week ago from Katie. And Katie, I, I did a favor for Katie and to, to repay the favor, I guess, she did this piece of art in its echo. The reason that I'm saying that she, she sent it to me be, just a, as a thank you, basically. So look at that. So that's echo on the ladder. It's incredible. So <laughs> I was like, do you mind this on the live stream? And she goes, people to think it would promote me on the thing. But the fact is, I knew you guys would like it. And I'm not trying to not show you things that that you'll like. So uh, I thought it was appropriate to show. So Katie um, has a company 
called printed paw prints. Wait, hang on. Sorry. Painted paw prints. I can't read because I don't have glasses on. www.paintedpawprints.com. And it's Katie McDonald. She's a fantastic artist. She does, obviously, animal um, animal prints. I don't know if... I, I mean, this is, this is charcoal. I don't know if all of it is charcoal or if she, I'm assuming some of it is paint. I, I don't know, but that's incredible. And, uh, I, I love it. It's so cool. I mean, it's a perfect, it almost looks like a photograph. It's, it's amazing. Um, all right. What have I, have I missed anything? So at this point, we're let's see. Let me make sure I got all the super chats. I think I did. You guys, somebody tell me if I missed any super chats, especially if there was any before. Okay, I have. I'm going to say that I haven't. All right. Um, so now I'm done with the clipboard. So now it's kind of a free for all. If anybody has questions, let's let's do this. Um, Stella is not out of her hide. Echo is right here coming down. Totally hunting. Absolutely hunting. Don't you dare. See, this is, if she was an adult, even an adult super dwarf retake, I, I wouldn't just be putting my hand here for her to follow it. I'm reasonably confident that she knows that this is my hand. However, Echo is also not to be trusted all the time. <laughs> so uh, she's doing well though. Her she doesn't have the big round eyeballs. Her, you know, the fact that that I can see her her eyes really well is helpful because that's telling as to whether she is in food mode or not. When her when her pupils go big and round, that's that's her getting all of her senses heightened. Because she's getting ready to take a meal. Sometimes, not not always. Like sometimes, it just means that she's in a dark area. If it, if it's dark, it, you know, so her eyes will be will be big and round, too. But um, hi, you want to come see us? Can you come down? Let's see. No. You stay up there. Okay. You stay up there then. Does anybody else want to see? Do you, do you have do you have um, snakes that you want to see? You can, if you have a snake that you know by name that you'd like me to get out, you can request it. Some are not available for certain reasons, but uh, I think most of them are probably. Um, hang on. Guys, I'm trying to. Uh... Top Furt says, uh, what if you feed snakes on a different schedule and the ones that aren't being fed really want some too? <laughs> that happens. I feed all my snakes on a different schedule. And th this particular snake always wants some. And so I have to decide if, uh, if I'm going to feed her something or not. Um, and, and usually it's no, I, I usually try to stick to, I, I'm not trying to feed her every single week. You know, it's like every 10 days in, at this point, but I did last week. She got two meals in, in a week because she digested the first meal that I gave her. She digested immediately. Um, and she's on a growth spurt and she was being crazy a few days later when I was feeding other snakes. So I was like, fine, I'll give you another one. So I gave her another one. It's very rare though, that I would do that. Um, <laughs> Top for it's asking if I can get out the inspector. Um, yeah, I, I can. We don't know what mood he's going to be in. I mean, he's not, I, he's, I'm pretty convinced that he'll never bite me, but, um, I'll, I can get him out and, and try, like he'd be starting to come out. Well, no, he wouldn't in about an hour or two is when he would start to come out anyway. 
Uh, all right. So there's a request for the inspector. I'm going to think about this. Uh, Dolly or Freya. Yes, we can. Natty's garden would like to see Dolly or Freya. I believe Dolly's in shed. If I remember right, let me double check. Let's see. Um, yeah, Dolly's in shed. Freya, I think is available though. Hold on. Let me check. Let me check Freya. Oh, mama, look at you. Look how pretty you are. Oh my gosh. Oh, you're so pretty. Come here, come hang out with us. Here's Freya. We'll hang out with Freya for a little bit. She's doing good. She's slowly getting back up to weight. She would love to get back up to weight faster, but I, I tend to do it slower. Um, with her, she's doing good, but she's very interested in eating every meal that I, that I feed her. Uh, Daunton is asking how many ball pythons do you have that like to strike every time you open their enclosure? So, uh, I, I don't have any ball pythons that like to strike every time I open their enclosure. I have a couple that are very food motivated, but they're also target trained. So, um, and I'm talking about probably my most food motivated that, that I think would strike sometimes is bear. He's my pie. He's a pied head clown boy and the Sundance kid who was named the Sundance kid because he strikes so fast. Um, he's a cinnamon head sunset. And Bear and the Sundance Kid are always ready. They're always right there at the at the tub. But other than I think the Sundance Kid did it once where he where he struck immediately when the tub opened. But what they're doing though is they're looking for their target. So they're there and they're waiting to see that target because that means that they can it doesn't mean they can strike. They don't usually strike the target, but but they know that that's the next step for them getting food. It's not just their tub opening, uh, which I think is is interesting. Okay, uh, Susan's asking for Lydia Dietz. I think we can accommodate that. Uh, let's see. I'm just scrolling down, you guys. Taylor's asking for Kata. I think we might be able to do Kata. Um, Maybe, maybe we'll just do quick hellos with a few snakes. Kata hasn't been out for a while. Kirna, thanks so much for the super chat. I hope I'm saying your name right. Kirna, Kirna. Thank you for that super chat. Uh, hi, Bob. Love your videos. Thanks so much. I wanted to say thanks for being so available to the community for questions and chats. You've really gathered a fun group of people here. Oh, that's so nice. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a nice super chat that didn't even come with a question. Um, yeah, I think this community is, has, has, and it's not really my fault. It's just that really cool people have jumped in and the community here when you, when, like when you're in the chat at these live streams, but also on discord, by the way, um, oh, I forgot the Patreon boards. I totally forgot those. I gotta, I gotta grab those. Um, but the the community on Patreon is awesome. Those people are getting to know each other and just really cool um, and and uh, really good w with bringing new people into the fold. And same with over on Discord. The the Discord server is great, and that that one's free. Like anybody can can jump into the Discord, and. Uh, that is a really cool community. And so I appreciate the people in that community that are, that are kind of responsible for being cool and bringing people in. Um, Alec is asking me about how to tell Spectre from yellow belly, super stripe and a pie belt cut. No idea. I'm sorry, <laughs> I can't answer. Um, 
Uh, Taylor, thanks for saying the horde is where it's at. I didn't mean to click on that, but I appreciate that. Uh, so Alec, yeah, sorry. I, I don't deal with Spectre and I know a lot of those yellow belly, like it's impossible to tell yellow belly from asphalt. That's, those are the two that I do deal with. You can't tell those two apart, um, until you put them into combos. Uh, so I am not a morph expert. I am pretty good with the morphs that are here in the green room. I'm pretty good with them, but I, I'm, I'm just not like, I don't have a huge encyclopedia of, of, uh, morph knowledge. I'm going to put Freya back while we're sitting here chatting. Um, I'm not free roaming any of my snakes right now because I have to replace my couch because when the inspector was going crazy, the video that you guys saw, I reached down at one point behind the couch and I was, I was like on my knee on the couch and all my weight was on my knee and a spring busted through the bottom of the couch. Like as though the couch, you know, a couch that you see sitting in somebody's front yard. That's what my couch looks like right now. So I've got an exposed spring that I either need to just fix the couch or better yet, get just get something new. I might do that. Um, but in the meantime, I can't free roam my snakes because that's a hazard for them. So I'm, hang on. Let me, let me just help Freya get back in here. She's going into her hide real quick. And then uh, looking for Echo. Echo's right there. Can you see her? Oh, yeah. You can see her little head right here. She is hunting right now. And when Echo's... A lot of people wonder how, how I know, like, if she's hunting versus wandering or whatever. And snakes are, snakes are all different. Like, each personality is different. And you kind of learn that. But, but with Echo, and I think this is pretty common with, with retics, she gets real slow about her, um, you know, she's roaming, she's, she's cruising around, she's getting exercise, right? This behavior that you see where it's just her neck down here and she's just tongue flicking on something. She'll sit for five minutes, 10 minutes in a spot, kind of an ambush position, sometimes fully in ambush position. And then she'll move to another spot and sit for five or 10 minutes. That tells me that she's hunting and this kind of stuff that she's doing with just, um, slowly moving around, but just tongue flicking everything. She's being a little hunter. All right, let's, um, I had a couple requests for other snakes. Let me see what, let me see what Kata and uh, Lydia Dietz are up to and we'll see what snake I come up with. So it's Kata. Lydia, I didn't want to get out because she's in a spot in her enclosure that she's usually not at. She's on the warm side, and that means that she wants to be there because she's not usually there. So we got Kata. And Amy's going to be happy to see this when she watches the replay. She's gone right now. Hi, what are you up to? You checking me out? Can you guys see Echo sort of behind the mic? Yeah, I just sat down, but you know what? If you, did you see that? She did. She didn't get me, but she tried. Stop it! Stop being a hunter. All right, so I got to watch that one. Um, she does that sometimes. She'll open her. She'll kind of go for it, but then she she sort of also knows it's me, but also her brain is in food mode. So it's kind of like rather than striking and clamping down, she just kind of mouths for a second, and then I. Get away. Hey, stop it. This is crazy. Go up there. All right. So that thing, uh, it's that it a lot. So my crazy food mode a lot. That's my black headed Python. And with her, 
if I, this is super, that what Echo just did is not that common. So every movement that I make now, she thinks is food. So I'm going to have to put her back. Um, and I've got to get Kata back to do that. So sorry about that, you guys. This is a really fast hello for Kata. And then we're going to deal with Echo. So here's this beautiful mama. I'm going to put her back. And then let's just see how we do with Echo. Getting her back in her cage. So what I said earlier, she's right now she's in she's in ambush mode, kind of, or ambush position. She'll sit kind of hanging off this thing. And this is this would be like if a bat flies by, she'll she'll grab it, right? Really, really quick to to grab at anything that's gonna come by her ambush thing. And the the issue right now on this tree is that her tail, like I've got to handle her tail get that off of what it's wrapped around currently if I'm if I'm going to get her down because all she's going to do if I take if I grab her by her midsection is she's going to wrap her tail on something so this could be an issue Ugh. all right what I might do is just put her up higher so she's All right, she's in a weird position right now, but uh, I'm going to leave her there until she removes herself and we'll see how this goes. You guys like when the drama happens in, in the snake room. And I said, so I said when I brought her out, I said that I feed them at all times during the day. So it shouldn't be a problem that it's at night. And I'm going to change my mind on that. It's not that it's not. I think that at night they are more like, Echo wouldn't be like this in the middle of the day. She might be in food mode a little bit, but she would easily get out of it. It wouldn't be a problem. But uh, we are in the evening right now, and she's kind of in crazy food mode at this point. Um, third, let's see who's uh, 13 Laura K. 13 Laura K. I think I said that right. Thanks so much for the super chat. Besides my Royal, I have a couple other snakes with little heads and skinny little necks, but big bodies, how to gauge prey size. Uh, don't Lorraine. Um, good question, Lorraine. Don't worry about the head and don't worry about the neck in general. Uh, I say in general, because there are certain snakes that need a little bit smaller prey items, but, but generally you, the way you gauge prey size is you want to feed them something that's about as thick as the thickest part of the body. Now, if you can tell me what kind of snakes your other snakes are, I might be able to help if I know that particular species. Uh, I might be able to tell you if that rule applies to them or not. It doesn't really apply to my black headed Python. And that's kind of rare with most snakes. That's, that's the case. My black headed Python, uh, I need to feed smaller meals more often. And really with the super dwarves, they can eat a meal that's much larger. You know, they have such skinny, long bodies that they can eat a meal that's pretty fat and leave a massive lump in their stomach. But because their bodies are so long, that's they they can use all that, you know, um, versus a ball python that has a shorter body that's fatter. You're going to feed them something. It leaves a lump, but it's not massive. You know what I mean? Uh Let's see. So 13, uh, let's see. Uh, that is Lorraine. And then Nick left his super chat. Thanks, Nick. Uh, Nick says, Kent, you know, Kent's corner. Oh yeah. I know Kent's corner. I'll pay you $5 to hijack Bob's live stream. <laughs> Man, if Kent was here, he'd be on that $5. Uh, that it's actually four 99. You'll pay him four 99 to hijack. I tell you what, I will give that four 99 to Kent and possibly the next live stream he'll hijack. Or maybe we'll open the live stream with Kent. That might be the thing to do. We haven't we haven't had Kent on a live stream in a very long time. It's probably been a year. <laughs> Thanks for that super chat, Nick. Uh, 
Not your average grandma. Super chat. Kent has green eyes. Now, not your average grandma has a snake named Kent. Um, one of the babies. Let me see where Echo is. Oh, she's she's coming down to stalk me. That's cool. So uh, one of the babies went to not your average grandma. And uh, that snake's name is Kent, so, which is great. Kent has green eyes. Is it genetics or just got lucky? I've never had green eyes ball python before. Um, so here's the thing. Your snake, Kent, is... Does he have green eyes? Now I got to look. And now I got to look at pictures. Because if I remember right, Kent is a spot nose. I don't think he has inchy. But Inchy was in the mix, and Inchy gives green eyes. So maybe he's low expression Inchy. Um, unless I'm forgetting. I think he's just a spot nose. He's he's a spot nose. Yeah. Uh, so maybe if he's got if he's got green eyes, maybe he's low expression Inchy. It's possible. So that's cool. I'll, I'm gonna have to look at pictures. I'm gonna have to get back to you on this. Um, wait, where are we at? There we go. Um that's interesting, though. I don't know that I noticed that on him. I got to look at pictures again. Hang on. I'm just checking Echo's progress. She's so slow when she's stalking things. And the movement of my head and my hat. Like, you guys saw her fall when she when you could see her. You saw that anytime my arm moved or my hand moved, she was on it. She's just looking at that movement and keying in. Her thinking brain is shut off right now. This is the, the second what's considered the second most intelligent snake in the world is a reticulated python. And right now in hunting mode, that brain is shut off. Even though she knows it's me, she's still just keying in on movement. It's all, um, it's all just, uh, hey, it's all just instinct at this point. Hey, you see that hook? Can we get you out of food mode with that hook? Crazy girl. All right. Um, Chibi Peach, thanks for the super chat. Sorry I missed. I'll watch the rest later. Squishy escaped during his dinner and wrapped himself inside my old metal factory desk. Just got him free and he's okay. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that you got him free. That's crazy. Escaped during his feet. So were you feeding him outside? Escaped during his dinner. And wrapped himself inside my old metal factory desk. Maybe left the enclosure open while he was eating. Um, that's crazy. Uh, let's see. Danielle is asking, is Kent single? You know, he is. S sadly for all of us, Kent is single. Um, and... Uh, and he, and he's look he's always looking does he ever do or say the right thing no he doesn't but he is he is single yeah great question great question okay hang on i'm just scrolling through you guys um Amy, you're back. Welcome back. Glad you're here. Did you see Kata? I had Kata out for a second, but then I had to deal with Echo, so I had to put her back. Uh, for those of you who haven't been following along, Kata is Amy's favorite snake. If you watch the very end of the video where Amy was in the green room uh, identifying all my snakes and their genetics correctly, which was crazy, at the very end of that video, we reveal who Amy's favorite snake is. And it was Kata because Kata doesn't act nervous when, when Amy's holding her for some reason. Um, she does when anybody else holds her, but she was pretty relaxed with Amy. Uh, okay, I'm just looking for questions that are just easily grabbed. Let's see. Yeah, I, it, yeah, he spot knows. I have picks too. I mean, I've got. I think I've got picks that show his eyes. I'll, I'll just have to look. Um, but you can send them too if you have some good ones. All right, where are we at on this? We we are about two hours in, you guys, which means that we're we're pretty close to done. 
but I will answer a couple other questions. Also, my whiskey is almost gone. So over the course of two hours, I've had about this much whiskey, um, which means I probably could, could use a little more. Um, Chibi Peach, another super chat. Thank you for that. I turned my back and he popped the lid while I was getting the rat I grabbed for him, but he's remarkably fast for a sausage and got in the struts and got, and got tangled up. I get it. <laughs> that kind of thing happens. That's crazy. Thanks for that super chat. I'm so glad that you safely got him out. That's a tough thing when a snake is in the middle of eating and you're trying to like put them back in their enclosure or get them, you know, just kind of move them somewhere. It's a tricky situation. Boba Fettuccini, whose screen name I love. Any tips for a first time ball python buyer? I have so many tips. I think the biggest one would be to watch as many videos, not just mine. I mean, I'm biased. Mine are good, but there are others that are good too. Just watch watch all those videos. And as far as just buying, um, just buy, you know, get, get what you like. Get what you like. And uh, buy and buy from somebody that you like. If you if you love a snake and you think it's really great, but that seller you kind of don't trust for some reason or it seems sketchy, walk away because there are tons of snakes that you'll fall in love with. That's my. What are you doing? Don't stalk me, crazy girl. Look at this, you guys. Oh wait, maybe you can see her. Hang on. Where's her head? Oh, it's kind. She it's coming down. She's right there. Yeah, tongue flick on my finger. There you go. Look at that. All right. You can see her. Um, uh, young gun, young gun barbecue. First time ball buyer, non-reptile owner, should I start with an adult or raise from a baby? I always tell people it's, I think it's cool to raise from a baby. I mean, there's pros and cons to each, but if you buy a baby and get them set up well, you know, you're, you're raising that snake. So it gets used to you. It gets used to the room. It, it, um, you're not, you're not dealing with, with a snake that you don't really know their history. You don't know what they were, what they were used to before or whatever. I think, I think a baby is is better to raise if it's your first. GB Peach is asking on in tips on something to put in the enclosure for enrichment other than plants. Yes. Anything I say this a lot, you've probably heard me say this. Anything that's a piece of cardboard like let's say part of a box part of a box. They love to sit in little things like this. This would be, um, this is usually like a toilet paper roll, but I happen to have a box that, that I cut up. Uh, anything that's cardboard is, is great or plastic thing, you know, as long as they're not going to hurt themselves on it or whatever. As long as it's relatively safe, all that kind of stuff is good. And, and just anything, you know, for the super dwarves, I find stuff at target or whatever, and, and I mean, I have bigger stuff for them to climb around on, but when I'm at a store, I'm often walking the aisles looking for just random stuff that's made for your kitchen or whatever that, that actually would be good. It's a couple bucks and it would be good to throw into an enclosure. Um, I do that a lot. Sammy, should I be moving my ball pythons to feed them? I've been told yes and no. The people that have told you yes are incorrect. And um, I say incorrect uh, because of, of what we have found over the years and years of people saying this to, to move a ball python to, to feed them or a snake in general, move, move to feed. It's that is an old outdated myth that snakes get cage aggressive if you feed them in their enclosure. But the fact is that it's much healthier for the snake. You risk regurgitation if you move them. So it's healthier for the snake. Uh, if you just let them live in their enclosure and they know that that is also where they eat, um, they don't get cage aggressive. 
snakes that food motivate motivate us or they're like hooked like that. So don't move your snakes to feed. Okay, hold on. I'm going to answer a couple more questions and then we will be done. Thanks for staying with me, you guys. There's so many, so many of you have stayed for the majority of this thing, if not the whole thing. I really appreciate it. I hope you're, I hope you're doing something. I hope you're like cleaning your snake cages or whatever while you're listening to this. Um, Because you don't need to watch my face the whole time, right? It's not that good of a face. I mean, it's a pretty good face, but it's not that good to watch it for two hours. Uh, okay, hold on. Let me find some. You guys, I'm sorry if I'm if I skipped your question. I'm going kind of fast, and I'm just not seeing everything. Captain Nitro is saying, "I'm terrified of boas and pythons because of their excessive need for humidity." How hard is it maintaining humidity and what are some tips you recommend? Um, so it's it's not that hard. They don't really have an excessive need for humidity. What I consider excessive is like a, um, a rainbow boa to me has an excessive need for humidity. They need really high humidity. And if they don't get it, they will die. They'll just, they, it's not that they'll stop eating. It's that they just go, I'm checked out. See ya. I'm dead. Um, and I'm talking about babies more more so than adults, although adults are pretty pretty fragile, I think, also, if you don't get their humidity right. Um, ball pythons and boas uh, need a certain degree of humidity, but so does most reptiles. And um, uh, if you don't have, if you haven't done it before, it might seem daunting, but it's not that hard. You just get the, the correct substrate that holds moisture and you get an enclosure that will hold humidity in and then it's, then it's no problem. Um, so there's a lot of us with, you know, a lot of times in my house, my house oftentimes is very humid, but it's also sometimes 30% humidity, which is way too low for the, my snakes, but my snakes are in enclosures that are at 80% humidity while the outside is at 30%. So it's not that hard to do. You just have to learn. It's, it's just like everything else. You have to learn it and know what you're supposed to do and what, what you're supposed to get. And then once you know what you're doing, it's easy to do. Um, but when it, it seems daunting, when you don't know what you're doing, when you don't understand it quite, quite right. It's like, it's like setting up heat, a, a heat system on a, on a thermostat. Like the first time you do that, whether you have overhead heat or a heat mat or whatever, and you're told that you need a thermostat. A lot of times people are like, what do I even, what does that even mean? Like, I don't know how to deal with a thermostat. What is that? And it seems really daunting, but it's actually very easy. You just have to go through the process of learning how to do it, um, which is not hard. Hey, stop that. Oh my gosh. Can you guys see this? So here's another thing. I don't know if you could tell, but her her head will shake. She'll She'll go like this. And that means that she's very close to striking. So... She does. She wouldn't usually strike from that far away, but she started doing that, and I was like, "You are gonna strike at my eye! Like she's gonna like go for the eyes." Hey, stop it, please. Look at, look at. Yeah, that's a hook. Look at that. It's a hook, isn't it? So this is crazy. I'm gonna have to. Like once I'm done with this live stream, which is going to be in mere minutes here, I'm going to have to get on a stool and deal with the front of her. I'm not worried about getting bit. Like the only thing, the only thing that I get concerned about is I'm not watching her. So she could totally come down and just strike at me. Uh, and then if she does, she does. But you guys have seen her strike at me before. It doesn't really cause damage. Um, here she comes. <laughs> Look at her. She's like, ah, oh, that's food. I'm going to eat that giant human. Um, what was I saying? So I'm going to have to get on a stool and deal with her tail that's all wrapped up in the stuff that's above where you can't see. But it's going to be all wrapped up in that. And then I got to get her head and then get her back in the enclosure. And it'll probably require a hook. Um, 
All right, let's see if there's something else. And then I got to get on that Echo project. Chibi Peach, so many super chats from you. Thanks so much. My squishy is super shy still. Suggestions? Yeah, um, look at that. Look at that video that I put out fairly recently. It might be called How to Tame a Snake or something like that. Or Can a Snake Be, be Tamed or something. Um, that's got suggestions for specifically, there's a whole section where I talk about and show where I sit next to a cage that's just open and I just spend time hanging out right there and letting that snake see me and, uh, and not necessarily reaching in and grabbing them all the time. That's a really helpful thing. There's a number of things you can do, but that's, that's the biggest tip. I think that that is, um, the most helpful thing, especially for a young snake, uh, to, to experience you without, without the scariness of you holding them, you know? Thanks, Amy. I'm <laughs> glad you like my face. I appreciate that. I like your face too, especially the, I don't know how well you guys can see Amy's profile photo, but that's, that's her at, um, at the Renaissance fair where she's a belly dancer and she's wearing black lipstick. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Helen, I answered this question. So um, watch, watch back at the end of the stream. I'm struggling with the same issue to feed my ball, ball python uh, multiple rats. Got it. Handled it. You just got to go back a bit. It was probably 45 minutes ago or so. Yeah, that's right. Um, 13 Lori K. Lori K. I've heard that as well, that the Brazilians are the fragile ones. Colombians are a little bit more hardy. I have heard that as well. Again, I don't have personal experience with it, but the word on the street. P. Lee, that's a good question. My ball python moves around his terrarium a lot. Should I be worried? Not necessarily worried, but that is stress behavior if they're doing that during the day. Um, they should be high, more hiding during the day. And so a lot of times when you get a new snake for the first, maybe even a couple weeks, uh, sometimes they'll settle down sooner than that. But sometimes for a couple of weeks, they'll, they'll kind of cruise the enclosure during the day. And um, uh, if they, if they're not settling down, th something needs to change about their enclosure. They need more clutter or hides or something like that. But that is, that is stress behavior if it's happening during the day. Um, okay, so you guys are you guys are answering that question as well. Sometimes I get to questions and and I answer them here, and then I see that everybody else is answering also in the chat. Um, Lauren, I answered this one also earlier. You probably weren't in, but the the biggest thing for transitioning a ball python from mice to rats is uh, uh, something that works often is that you just um, scent their enclosure with a mouse and then feed them the rat when they come looking for it. When they come out of their hide looking, you just hand them the rat and they're in food mode. They usually will strike without asking questions as you've seen with this snake. Quit it. Quit it. Come on. Come down. Get your tail. Yeah. Come all the way down. So I'm the bait in this, in this case. Are we going to be able to pull you off of this thing? Nope, we're not. All right. Last one, you guys. Let me go all the way to the end. Oh, man, I'm so far. Jeez. I've missed so much, you guys. Hey, what are you doing? What are you? You're not going to. Stop this craziness. This is all craziness from you, Echo. Not cool. 
Not cool. All right. I've missed a lot of questions. I'm going to go through here and maybe what I'm missing is just chats between you guys. But if I've missed a ton of good questions, maybe I'll make a separate video answering them. So we'll see. Uh, but we are, we are two hours and 15 minutes in. Echo is contemplating biting my shoulder. We'll see if she does it or not. Um, thanks for joining me, you guys. <laughs> I appreciate your, uh, support of the channel. I appreciate the fact that you guys are with me for so long. This is such a long, uh, such a long live stream. Natty's garden. I use your suggestion to, uh, to use a flashlight to find poops and it worked like a charm, right? It's a good tip. Like it seems silly, but it works so well. All right, you guys, I'm going to try to not get eaten by a very tiny super dwarf. And so I'm out of here. Uh, thanks you guys. I'll see you next time.